Hello everyone, uh, this is Austin Scharf of the Department of Commerce and it is the top of the hour. We'll probably expect a few more people to log in here in the next few minutes, but I thought I would walk us through the basic functionality functions of WebEx um, as we get started today. First off, today's uh, presentation will be uh, will feature uh, SBW Consulting and throughout the presentation, we want to encourage you uh, to submit comments or questions. You can do that using the chat box. The chat box is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, moving your cursor down there, you should see a little, uh, you should see uh, seven icons pop up. Uh, the third one from the right has a little text bubble in it. If you click on that, the chat box will open up. Please make sure to send your questions to everyone and not to uh, the Commerce Energy Policy uh, user or um, SBW Consulting uh, themselves. Uh, if you send it to everyone, everyone will be able to read it and we'll be able to get those questions in front of them. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, the questions and comments uh, will probably not be seen by the presenter because that creates a little gray box, which I'm seeing right now, San Diego. Um, and maybe we can get rid of that box there. Um, so we will primarily encourage everyone to use the chat box throughout today's presentation and um, reserve uh, any oral questions till the end of the presentation. Uh, you can also uh, raise your hand using the raise your hand function. Uh, you can find that uh, in the pa participants panel, which is you can click the icon next to the text bubble icon with the little person. You can click on that. That will open the participants panel and you should see a little hand um, to the left of the mute unmute button. Clicking on that, that hand will raise your hand and then please unclick on it again and unraise your hand once you have asked your question or comment. Again, we primarily encourage people to use the chat box today, but if you feel like you need to um, ask your question orally, feel free to do that as well. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Emily Salzberg, the Department of Commerce, to do uh, a more formal introduction. Thank you, Austin. Can everybody hear me okay? You're good to go. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to our June 18th pre-rulemaking pre workshop for clean buildings. My name is Emily Salzberg, as Austin mentioned, and I'm joined by my wonderful colleagues here from Department of Commerce. Um, that is our building standards and performance team. We're going to be presenting today along with SBW and the 2050 Institute. Santiago, next slide. Commerce's core mission is to strengthen communities. Next slide. So brief agenda review for our time together today. We're scheduled to conduct this webinar through noon. We're gonna work very hard to make sure we leave in a break so folks have a chance to stretch, grab a cup of coffee and take care of yourselves. Um, what we're hoping to accomplish today is Commerce will be providing a brief context and overview for this work. SBW and the 2050 Institute will present on building typology, revisions to work on means. We'll take a break and then discuss normalizations and target scenarios and considerations. With time allowing, Commerce will conclude the webinar with a brief overview of next steps on our rulemaking process and where we're headed from here. Next slide. So just a quick reminder about our Clean Buildings webpage. This is your go-to location for all Clean Buildings related activity, references, and workshop materials. All questions and comments should be emailed to buildings at commerce.wa.gov, which is referenced at the bottom of this slide here. Next slide. So just a real brief context for our conversation today. Uh, instructions for commerce in RCW 1927-210 are to develop energy use intensity targets by building type that are no greater than average. 
we are to take unique energy features into consideration, along with regional and local building utilization data. Targets need to be developed for at least two climate zones. So Commerce contracted with SBW and the 2050 Institute back in the fall to complete this work. Next slide. Our pre-rulemaking activity started in early fall of 2019, and man, that feels like a long time ago already. <laughs> Uh, we posted a series of workshops to build awareness of ASHRAE Standard 100 and to provide both context and considerations for building investment criteria and the methodology that would inform how we establish energy. Emily, if you could hear us, uh, we lost um, we lost you. We can't hear you. I think she was muted. Apologies for the technical difficulties. I'll send your host again. Yeah, I know, and I think that's what messed this up here. Okay. Can you make me host or unmute Emily? Yeah, I've unmuted her. I can't see her call in user. It's Emily. Call in user there you too. Go. It's it's Emily. It's I renamed it as Emily. Okay. Okay. Emily, you there? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Wonderful. I have no idea where uh, you lost me. <laughs> All right. I'll, um, I'll start over with this uh, slide on our rulemaking activity and schedule. Anna Lynn, does that seem reasonable with where you lost me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So our pre rule making activity started in early fall of 2019. Uh, we've hosted a series of workshops to build awareness of ASHRAE Standard 100 and to provide both context and considerations for building investment criteria and the methodology that would inform how we establish energy use means and targets. In the winter, we began releasing draft rule language for comment, and we want to thank you all for your thoughtful involvement in this process. All of your comments have been read and carefully considered. We're close to wrapping up our series of workshop, workshops here uh, next month in July, and we will be moving forward with filing our CR 102 form to the Code Revisor's Office, which will move us along to the next phase of rulemaking. I want to thank everybody for your active participation. Next slide. So here's an overview of SBW's workshop work to date. Um, they've been active participants and have done incredible work. Their efforts have been thoughtful, defensible, and transparent. Um, we look forward to the discussion today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Faith, Poppy, and Santiago. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, Santiago, you wanna, okay, there we go. Uh, so this is Faith DeBolt um, with SBW Consulting, and um, I will be leading off our presentation here, uh, and then Santiago uh, from SBW and Poppy from 2050 Institute will be doing most of the presenting today. So um, uh, Santiago, next slide. Uh, quickly. Uh, Emily already um, talked about an agenda, uh, so a little more detail here. Um, we'll be going through the revised means, talking about normalization factor analysis, presenting what we're calling the continuum of targets that we're looking at, and then the kind of considerations of how to think about um, the where the targets should land. Uh, next slide, please. And actually, you can skip this one because uh, Emily already touched on that. Uh, so, uh, first here, um, I wanted to, uh, this, I'm going to talk about a, a recap of the public inputs, but before I get into that, um, first, I want to do kind of a, a quick review um, of what the basis of our work is uh, and acknowledge that not everyone um, maybe has been able to follow along as closely and attend all of the workshops. So um, 
the first thing I want to say is that there is not a database of commercial buildings in Washington state with energy use and floor area of all those buildings. Um, since the state law requires, uh, as Emily um, was reminding us, that the targets be no higher than the mean energy use intensities or EUIs, um, we needed to have some basis for developing those means. And um, what we did was we leveraged um, a couple of other or uh, several other uh, uh, data sets that are out there. Primarily the 2012 uh, Commercial Building uh, Energy Consumption Survey, or CBEX, you'll hear us say that a lot today, and then which is a national data set, and then um, a collection of data sets from the, a regional study uh, called Commercial Building Stock Assessment, or CBSA. The latter is um, a combination of data from 2009, 2014, and 2019 studies. So um, that's sort of a review of, of the basis and what you'll, you'll hear us talking about CBEX and CBSA a lot. Um, and the next thing I wanna address before I get into the specific um, uh, public input that I have in front of you is that um, generally addressing, looking at the feedback um, that we received and also digging deeper into the 2019 CBSA data, which if you were on the last uh, webinar, um, you may remember uh, me saying that we received that data uh, two days before we released the uh, slide deck last time. So we were eager to get it incorporated into our analysis, but um, hadn't really had the time to um, really understand the, the impact. And so after having the time to really dig into that data and also incorporate the input uh, that we received from the public. Uh, there were a few, uh, several kind of fundamental ways that we um, shifted our analysis that I, I don't have pointed out here on the slide, but um, one is that we uh, um, looked at, we, we noticed that the 2019 energy use data in CBSA was um, the percentage of it was more largely modeled than the earlier, the 2014 and particularly the 2009 was more actual energy bills. And so we were concerned we had, we had decided earlier on to exclude the model data and we decided that we should go ahead and include the model data from all three studies uh, to make sure that we're including the most recent data because otherwise it was causing us our data to skew to the older data. Um, and then in, in doing that, um, we needed to be consistent in our treatment of the CBEX data. And so we decided to include the all CBEX data, um, um, whether it was modeled, imputed, or actual energy use. Um, and then once we were once we did that, we um, realized we could uh, apply the sample weight. So that allowed us to have a fuller um, more representative uh, data set. Uh, and another piece to, um, that we added in was um, we had pr uh, previously excluded the Idaho buildings from the CBSA data, um, and we decided to add those back in because um, it, uh, it provided more buildings in, the cli in the, um, a climate that's similar to Eastern Washington. Um, and so the result of doing all of that is that we have just a, a more robust, robust data set. And um, the main impact on the change um, compared to what uh, we presented last time was that we're uh, more heavily relying on the CBSA um, data this time. And you'll be seeing that, uh, uh, I think next Santiago will be um, describing the, the updates to the revisions that we've uh, the updates to the uh, uh, analysis that we conducted. So, um, and so here um, are were some other areas uh, of how we addressed uh, public input or, or what we noticed. Um, we heard from the hospital association um, a concern about the uh, way that we adjusted the national uh, the national CBEX data. Uh, to the 
uh, Washington state climates, that's 5B and 4C, that the, the ratio that, that was there um, indicated that the uh, Eastern Washington energy use for hospitals, uh, for example, or uh, yeah, hospitals in particular was, um, would be lower um, than in Western Washington. And we agreed that that, that really just didn't make sense. And uh, other data sources that we looked into didn't really support that. So um, we're recommending that there not be two different targets for 4C and 5B, that it be one, the same target. Um, another comment was that the um, a request for uh, normalization uh, operating shift normalization factors for hospitals uh, for hours less than 168, and we didn't uh, have any data to provide a fact to develop a factor for that. And um, in further discussion, we um, uh, came up with recommending that um, the way to address um, when there's uh, less than 24-7 operation, it's it would typically be in um, uh, parts of the building that um, maybe could be use a different, um, you know, you could build up a weighted target. And so say, for example, there's clinics or other types of uses in, in the building, and then you can use the factors when you're developing that weighted target. So that's what we're recommending there. Uh, another comment was a medical office, um, a concern about it looked like non-diagnostic and diagnostic were um, kind of the opposite of what one might expect. And with all of the other changes that we made that I described a little bit ago, that kind of resolved itself. Um, so that issue went away. There was a, a comment about refrigerated warehouses of um, asking for uh, a factor to split out the kind of freezer type warehouses versus the refrigerated warehouses. And um, there was just no data to be able to support that. Um, and then finally, um, we had said last time that we were excluding um, buildings with less than 10,000 square feet, um, uh, it, particularly in the, in the restaurants and grocery. So that was like fast food and convenience store. And um, further discussion with commerce, we decided to add all of those back in. So in the um, both the CBEX and the CBSA data set, we are not excluding any buildings. And um, what that means is that you know, recognizing that there could be fast food um, type spaces and convenience store type spaces in buildings um, such that so, so we should have targets for them such that um, if you're building up a weighted target, you have um, that uh, that type of building and its representative um, EUI to to choose from. So I think that's it. Um, if there are any clarifying questions, you can go ahead and ask. Um, but I, I think we should keep moving because we have a lot to cover. And I talked too much. Santiago, you can take over. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Faith. Um, so first, we'll start off with uh, an overview of the methodology that we used to establish the mean EUIs. Um, so just a quick summary. We uh, calculated individual CBEX building EUIs from CBEX uh, 2012 data. Um, for each of these buildings, we assigned an appropriate climate zone ratio to convert that building from whatever climate it was in to a building that's in either 4C or 5B, um, or rather both 4C and 5B. So you end up with two, two different EUIs there. Um, and consequently, you can also calculate uh, an energy use um, after you have done that step. Um, and then this was used to generate uh, a mean EUI for buildings in Washington climate zones. And really, that just amounts to an average of 4C and 5B. Um, and that's what we're using for a comparison to regional data sets. So the next step would be to calculate uh, a mean uh, commercial building stock assessment EUI. So that's our big regional data set. Um, in this 
data set, we used 2009, 2014, and 2019 data to determine averages for Washington State. And then we applied a formulaic approach to determine that a CBSA or CBEX mean EUI should be used. Um, and that uh, formulaic approach is based on the relative errors uh, out of each of those data sets. Basically, you want, you want the, the data points that have the, the best um, statistical fit. Um, and uh, there is an updated memo on the methodology for establishing mean EUIs that uh, you can find uh, referenced in this presentation. You can click on this link here uh, in your own copy of the slide deck. Just a little note here about making adjustments to derive uh, uh, climate-adjusted CBEX mean EUIs. Um, here you see an example of uh, Table 7-2A uh, in Standard 100. Um, so these targets uh, are using climate ratios, which we, uh, which we also use to calculate EUIs for individual buildings. You can see here that an admin professional office in Zone 1A um, would have an EUI of 39 kBTU per square foot. And then if we were to project that same admin professional office uh, in the CBEX data set onto Zone 4C, it has uh, an EUI of 40. So that's a ratio of 40 over 39. And we did this for all buildings in the CBEX data set. Um, you can also apply the same methodology to uh, reverse uh, from the uh, statewide averages, which we calculated. Um, so that's how we convert back to 4C and 5B uh, mean EUIs. Here's a quick, uh, colorful overview of um, the ASHRAE building types, which we developed targets for. These are then further broken down later uh, into uh, Energy Star building types, but uh, the the typology here uh, is a little bit less, uh, is a little bit more condensed and easier to see. Um, so this is just the general trend that you can see here. And uh, overall, you see that uh, CBSA and CBEX are fairly close. And uh, in orange, you have the CBEX means for 4C. And then in green, you have the CBEX means for 5B. Blue is the commercial building stock assessment. So we have uh, 4C and 5B means for national data. And then we have uh, our regional data in blue. And uh, this, this is giving you an idea of where we start to build up our comparisons. So our methodology for selecting the correct EUI um, is formulaic and is summarized uh, here. So in case, and uh, these are in order of uh, precedence. So uh, first, if you see, if our data set has no mean EUI for a particular building type, we would just use the CBEX mean EUI. So that's the case here for laboratory. Um, and uh, you can see that the bar in green, which is the average Washington uh, estimated laboratory energy, um, and then on the right, you have the, uh, the final regional uh, ener uh, EUI in gray. Uh, so case two um, is if the CBSA relative error is less than the CBEX relative error and or um, the CBSA relative error is less than 15%. So we want it to be you know, uh, both, both better than CBEX and low. Um, and uh, uh, correct. And then we also want uh, a population of at least five to be s at least somewhat representative. So here you see um, the CBEX average EUI in green and the CBSA uh, in blue. And you can see that the relative errors are actually quite close uh, in terms of scale. And uh, that suggests with a population that's larger than five, quite large at 268, that the CBSA value is representative. So there you have it selected in gray. Case three, where the CBEX mean EUI is 
greater than uh, one standard error from the CBSA mean EUI. So this is a case where the CBSA relative error is large or the population is small. Um, so we would choose the CBEX EUI here, but we have to acknowledge that the CBSA, the regional data set, is different, that it shows that the regional EUI is at least higher in this case. So we adjust by one standard error closer to the CBS, uh, closer to the CBSA mean EUI. So you can see there the gray bar for recreation uh, is one standard error higher uh, closer to the regional EUI. So that's just an outline of our process there. Now, uh, we uh, have all of the EUIs for all of the ASHRAE building types uh, here. I'm going to go through these briefly um, and just highlight a few areas where uh, we uh, had some changes. Um, so here, uh, college, university uh, is different from what it was previously. Um, but as you can see, overall, the, the differences between CBEX and CBSA are not uh, enormous in most of these cases. Uh, food sales and food service, so we've added a few categories here that were not here previously. Uh, convenience store, convenience store with gas, um, and fast food. Now, I would caution that most of the time these would be inside of, you know, some, some other building or some composite building. Um, so that's, that's why they were not here previously, but they're here now. Hey, Santiago? Yes. Yeah. Comment come up. Uh, and it's from Jeff, it reads, in your mean EUI June 18 memo, you mentioned the team used total area, including parking for all da four data frames. Should parking area be included in owner calculated EUI for site specific targets? Um, well, to be consistent, uh, they should be. Um, Chuck, uh, I, I have to defer to you to what the actual rules say on that. Um, I, I'm struggling to remember whether uh, parking is explicitly included in the rules. Um, parking is excluded in the floor area calculation in the rules. Um, so the answer is we included um, parking in the EUIs for our means, uh, the rules say that they are different. Um, I think we could perhaps uh, discuss this a little bit towards the end of the presentation, I hope, um, but that, that, is, that is exactly what we did for our methodology. We used uh, the total floor area, so that's uh, consistent with the uh, CBEX methodology um, and the CBSA methodology. And, and I'll, this is Faith, I'll just add that um, we kind of didn't have a choice but to do that because it, we didn't have a way of separating out what was the parking floor area for all of the data sets. Uh, thank you, Faith. Um, so moving on here, uh, and uh, it, it occurs to me I see an error in this slide, so uh, please uh, forgive us there. Um, our, our decision uh, for hospital health uh, is not actually reflected here. Um, we move this to the uh, CBEX category here. So this, th the gray bar should actually be coming, coming up to this uh, green bar here. Um, I, I see we have a, an error in this slide, so my apologies for that. Uh, we'll, we'll try and get that fixed. Um, and, uh, the other general health care categories here, uh, so outpatient uh, health and uh, medical office uh, diagnostic uh, are reflected here in these gray bars. Um, so again, lodging, not a lot changed here. You see a big uh, EUI here for a dormitory, but as you can see, the population is small. So this is an example where we would have chosen the, the green bar and adjusted up uh, to uh, represent the final EUI. Moving on, um, to mercantile categories, um, and uh, one one thing to note here is that uh, the property type of strip mall uh, is not included in these EUIs, and uh, the determination there is that strip mall is uh, typically a mixed use type of facility. Uh, you have you know various mercantile and uh, 
food and other service activities which uh, need to be accounted for uh, properly. Uh, otherwise, the category is uh, quite broad and variable. So to properly represent it, it uh, requires a mixed use type, so it's not going to be listed here. Um, variety of offices. Public assemblies. Um, and I think uh, we will see some differences here for uh, religious worship. Uh, so uh, previously, um, we were closer to this uh, green bar here. Uh, religious worship uh, in this new assessment uh, is a little bit uh, is a little bit higher. Um, and uh, let's see, not a lot of changes here. Uh, I think uh, public order and safety has uh, increased somewhat uh, from what it was previously. Um, and if you want to address any of these later, uh, we can certainly come back to them. I'm just quickly going through them uh, so that uh, you can just see some general, general trends. Uh, services, warehouse and storage. This, here's another case where we saw uh, some differences. So uh, previously, uh, refrigerated warehouse was uh, adjusted uh, towards the uh, general trend of warehouses, uh, right? Because the CBSA data set doesn't have any uh, warehouses which are strictly defined as refrigerated, uh, we opted to keep the CBEX mean here. So uh, it's, it's exactly the same as the CBEX mean. Um, and one final note uh, so the uh, Means which we calculated included uh, multifamily mean EUIs. Uh, CBEX is a commercial uh, survey, so it doesn't include uh, much in the way of multifamily. I think it might have been integrated in some building types, but uh, it's, it's not a lot of explicitly multifamily floor area. So to develop means for this category, uh, we used regional building stock assessment data and City of Seattle benchmarking data. So the regional building stock assessment is much like our regional commercial building stock assessment, but it focuses on uh, residential types of buildings. Um, and uh, we selected buildings from the multifamily portion of the study. Um, the way that we've defined this mean for the moment is that it must have, uh, we, ex we kept only buildings that had 50,000 square feet of floor area and must have at least six floors in the building. Um, and as you may have guessed, because of the size of buildings, um, the only eligible buildings that were in the data sets, which we were able to use, uh, being both RBSA and City of Seattle, were in Zone 4C. Now we can uh, calculate a 5B multifamily building. Uh, the ratio would increase the EUI by about 2%. Since the EUI was quite low to begin with of uh, 32 kBTU per square foot, uh, this basically ends up being another 32 kBTU per square foot building. Uh, this could change if we were to change the parameters of multifamily and this uh, is still uh, a finding. It's, uh, I don't think, quite final. Um, and it should be noted that this definition is distinct from the ASHRAE multifamily definition. The biggest uh, multifamily building in ASHRAE is five plus units. As you can imagine, something that's 50,000 square feet and has six floors has way more than five units. So these EUIs would be considerably lower than that five plus uh, unit definition for ASHRAE. A little bit about normalization factors. Um, so we considered uh, public input to look for normalization factors, and really we're looking for a few things to develop these factors. Uh, we have to make sure that the data that we're using um, comes from a study or you know, survey that uh, is you know, statistically robust. Uh, we, of course, can consider information provided directly from stakeholders, but uh, to make sure that this process is uh, fair, uh, we have to stick with public studies. Um, so the uh, sh uh, normalizations which we ended up uh, calculating um, ratios for were occupancy and operating shifts. Um, this data was supported by CBEX, 
um, and was also supported by Portfolio Manager's uh, Predicted Energy Estimator, which uses a population of uh, Energy Star rated buildings to uh, calculate some regressions for occupancy. Um, so about the operating hours procedure, we uh, calculated mean operating hours for each building category in ASHRAE 100. So that's what we looked at previously in all those mean slides. Um, and the operating hours which we considered were 50 or less, 51 to 167, and 168 or 24-7 operation. Um, and we calculated uh, means for each of these subcategories and compared to the mean for the whole building type to get uh, a final ratio. Um, and we should note that uh, the data was not perfect for the whole of the uh, type uh, uh, list of buildings which we were looking for. So if we were not able to uh, support a change with sufficiently statistically robust data, we uh, were forced to stick with the ratio from ASHRAE 100. Um, those ratios are in the supplementary materials which were sent out. Now for occupancy, um, we use portfolio manager aggressions. And these metrics for occupancy are variable by building type. Um, so you know anything from full-time employees to number of computers to number of beds. Um, the ratios which we were able to calculate uh, included um, uh, office type buildings, hospitals, uh, hospitals uh, for density of MRIs, acknowledging that uh, patient density and equipment density could be different, um, hotels, residence halls, senior care, and uh, K through 12, so uh, elementary, middle, and high school. So to give an example of how these ratios pan out, uh, we could consider uh, an administrative office opening eight hours a day, five days per week, um, and it has 50,000 square feet uh, and 178 full-time employees per shift. Um, so that uh, works out to 0 0.00356 workers per square foot, 290 computers, so 0 0.0058 computers per square foot. Um, so as you can see by the definitions in the uh, lower right-hand corner for density, uh, that uh, puts this in a high occupancy category, and then based on the number of operating hours, that second uh, table there shows this to be in the 50 or less category. So the uh, operating shift ratio is 0.8, and the occupancy ratio is 1.4, so multiply all that out by the target for a building in 5B, uh, 0.8 times 1.5, uh, and uh, times 78, you get 87 kBTU per square foot. Um, now, the example two, uh, we consider more or less the same office, um, but it's open 24 hours a day, seven days per week. Very, very busy administrative office. 50,000 square feet. Um, now the employees per shift is pretty important here because that, uh, that same number of employees uh, has to be more or less in the building you know, throughout, the, throughout the whole day. Um, and this works out to uh, 164 kBT per square foot. So uh, a, a pretty large variance from the mean of 78 kBT per square foot. So a quick summary of uh, our determinants of energy use and how we address them. Um, so these were, again, based on public input um, and about how we might consider that uh, energy use in buildings would be different. Um, so just a, a quick um, key here, uh, the X's were uh, factors which we considered, um, did research on, and uh, the asterisks uh, represent um, things which kind of had a, a mixed uh, a mixed approach you know covered covered in um, uh, maybe you know more than more than one section um, and uh, as you'll notice that those there's kind of a, a mix of exclusions and uh, applicabilities here um, so uh, generally how these are addressed or summarized on the right uh, so the 
uh, buildings with multiple activities and mixed use uh, is addressed in policy and in the uh, guideline for Ashway 100. Uh, small floor areas, you know, are, are excluded, and that's mentioned in policy. Uh, but it is worth noting that we did include some small floor area building types uh, for mixed-use buildings. Uh, vacancy is again, uh, it's included in some of the uh, EUIs, but uh, we did make an effort to exclude them. And uh, vacancy is also covered in policy. Uh, occupancy density, uh, we just talked about as. Uh, uh, normalization uh, factor it should be listed here as a normalization factor, but it's also built into our mean EUIs, uh, so we covered it kind of in both of those. And uh, um, same goes for uh, operating shifts. Um, so uh, anyway, these are summarized here. If we want to go back and talk about these uh, later, I'm happy to do so, uh, but this is just a, a quick for your information. Um, so next, uh, Poppy will talk to you about the continuum of our draft EUI targets. Poppy? Thanks, Santiago. Yeah, so before we uh, go into this draft uh, EUI targets continuum, I just wanted to give you all a sense of uh, the flow of the remaining presentation. So first, uh, I'm going to go over briefly some of the goals and directives from 12, uh, from the law 12, HB 1257. And um, then I'm going to walk through the targets and just explain how we uh, came to develop the uh, ratios and uh, apply the ratios and show you what that looks like for the various building types. And I'm hoping that we can just feel free to ask clarifying questions as we go through that, but we're not really gonna have uh, the main discussion around the targets until after we run through them. You'll get a chance to see kind of where they're landing. And then I'll go over some key considerations for the target setting and uh, we can have some discussion around that. And then we'll be specifically speaking to newer construction at the end of the meeting. So for the goals and directives from HB 1257, Emily recapped some of this as well, but um, this is uh, a series of, uh, I, I think we could refer to it as design constraints that we really referred to to try to ensure that we were uh, in direct alignment with the law itself. And it also is a good um, kind of stage setting for how to think about the the target setting and where they could land. So the first item is that we need to uh, maximize greenhouse gas reductions in the building sector. We're using ASHRAE standard 100 as an initial model and that covers uh, a lot of different aspects of the structure of the policy as well as the targets. And um, we must establish EUI targets that are no greater than the average energy use intensity for any particular covered uh, commercial building type. We need to consider adjustments for unique energy using features as described previously. And then this standard will be updated every five years. So there is a, a continuum for the building performance standard the BPS cycle of every uh, five years. So that isn't really within the scope. Those subsequent cycles aren't within the scope of this particular target setting, but it's something to consider when we're thinking about what should these initial targets be in relation to maybe subsequent targets. And then the final consideration is that we may establish lower EUI targets for newer construction based specifically on the state energy code that was in place when the buildings were constructed. Next slide, Santiago. So for purposes of this presentation, we've developed a draft continuum of EUI targets. So it isn't uh, a recommendation per se, or even a specific draft 
EUI uh, set of EUI targets, but a continuum for purposes of review and discussion and consideration for uh, how these might be selected. So we've included the Washington EUI means as reference as that that maximum amount set by the law. And then we've also included a continuum of, of targets that are represented as ratios from the mean going all the way down to the ASHRAE 100 targets, which aren't actually a ratio. They're different for each building type because of the way that those targets were established. But it's useful to see where the ASHRAE 100 targets landed in relation to these ratios that we're presenting on the continuum. So we've used 5%, 10%, 15%, and 25% as examples. And these ratios are something that could also be considered in terms of both the uh, base EUI targets, the standard EUI targets, versus potentially what we might use for newer construction and how we may uh, develop those. Next slide. So the first category of buildings we have here is education, and we've included college, university, elementary, middle school, high schools, other classroom education, and preschool and daycare. And I'm going to use this slide to explain uh, how these uh, slides are constructed, constructed so you can get a sense of uh, how to think about the, the variations across these uh, potential targets. And then I'll walk through briefly the remaining uh, building types in case anybody wants has any clarifying questions or wants to talk about any of the specific building types. Um, as we go through it, but mainly we're including this series of slides for future reference uh, when you uh, review this um, after the presentation. So I'll start with college and university, and this gives you an example. The entire bar here to the top represents the mean. And so we've structured this as stacked bars to give you a sense of what it looks like when you go down 5%, 10%, 15%, et cetera. So the very top of the bar is the Washington mean, and that blue on the top represents uh, the difference between the mean and reducing by the next uh, ratio, which in this case is 5%. So the top of the orange line represents what the EUI would be at a 5% reduction and so forth. So the top of the gray going down is 10% reduction. The top of the dark blue is 15%, and the top of the dark orange bar is 25%. And obviously, that's the same going across all of these building types and for all of the subsequent building types. Then um, the ASHRAE 100 target is represented as an outline uh, neon green uh, framing. So you can see this is that, uh, you could say, end of the range or just an example of what it would be if, it, if it, they were to be set as the ASHRAE uh, 100 targets. And so they are different going across, um, the relationships are different going across the various building types, the ASHRAE percentage because they were developed based on medians and they had a different uh, approach for deciding uh, where they would settle on the actual target and ours are based on means. And so the green outline is going to represent a different ratio of each of these because all of our means have been established according to the process that Santiago just went over and are adjusted to our regional data, but I think it's still um, uh, informative and, and useful to see. So I'm going to stop there for a minute before I go on to any of the other building types and see if there are any 
questions on the target so far or how to read any of these uh, graphics. Right now, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Um, okay. No one has hand raised, but that doesn't mean there's not somebody out there typing something real quick here. Okay. Well, just, just let me know if something comes up and, and we can stop as we go through. There is one question here now. Have we given thought on how quote unquote newer construction can be incorporated into a compiled campus EUI? Um, I think that's a useful question. That's not necessarily something that we have addressed yet in this process, but I think it's something that uh, we could look at, especially after going over the approach to newer construction. I think that'll influence what this approach would be. And if if Commerce has any thoughts on this as well, I would I would defer to them. This is Chuck, not right now. Okay. All right, we have another question. Are you going to cover building code adjustment? Um, I may need a little bit more clarification on that. We will be discussing the influence of the code on the newer construction targets or what the potential targets could be. Um, we're not addressing the the building code in terms of adjustments for the the main base targets. But if there's any additional detail that Holly has uh, a question on, I'd be happy to answer that as well. If I didn't if I didn't cover it with that response. Yeah, and feel free to unmute Holly and ask your question. Um, and she uh, Holly also wrote. What about the difference between Oregon and Washington code? Yeah, well, a lot of this actually has a little bit more, uh, relates a little bit more to developing the means that the targets are based on. And um, so, uh, Santiago or Faith, if, if you have any comments on, comments on this, feel free to jump in. But I'll just say uh, at, a, at a basic level, the data that we're using from CVSA is not necessarily uh, distinguished in terms of the sample design between newer construction and existing construction. So it's a little bit harder to tease out those differences. So, um... Yeah, and, and I'll add on to that, um, that uh, when we look at, if, when we do try to look for differences between states, um, there's no consistent pattern or any way to distinguish that Oregon looks different from Washington and to attribute that difference to being a difference in code. This is Chuck, and let me just add to that. Um, the Oregon Washington codes didn't deviate much for commercial buildings until recently, so that sample size would be very small. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, everyone. Annalyn just uh, messaged me and said that it's uh, about time for a break, a 10 minute break. Is that correct, Annalyn? Um, let's make it five minutes. That's my alarm for the break. <laughs> so um, would this be okay for a, a good time for a break, Faith? Yeah, I think. Yes, we're... I think it's a perfect time, yeah. Okay, awesome. So uh, can we go, can we uh, reconvene back at 11? Did you have something to say, Austin? I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. If anyone has any questions as they kind of they continue to look in at this uh, graphic and mingle it over, um, you know, put your questions there and we can come back to them after the break. Right. Before let's, we move on. Let's get back at 11 a.m.
All right, it's about that time. Um, Poppy, do you want to do a sound check? I think you might be muted. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, there you go. All yours. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, shall we, maybe we should cover some of these questions that have come in during the break. I think that sounds like a good idea. We have one question from Holly that says, will these targets be compared to a real sample of buildings to verify that they're actually reasonable identifying buildings that have potential for improvement? I guess that, that, that there's probably two parts to the answer to this. Uh, the first part is that the means that were used to uh, become the basis of these targets were drawn from a sample of real buildings. Um, so that, that part of the methodology is uh, based on real buildings. In terms of uh, looking at these targets in relation to a sample of real buildings and applying the sample, applying the targets to those buildings, that's not currently part of the scope at this time. All right, well, those, that's the question that we have in there. So I guess let's, uh, and no hands are raised, so let's move forward. Okay, sounds good. Can you move to the next slide, Santiago? Okay, so this is food sales and service. And again, I'm not gonna, you know, look through uh, the specific building types because this process with the various ratios is just being applied uh, pretty systematically, but definitely uh, raise your hand if there's something specific in here that you'd like to talk about, or we can also go back uh, some slides. But similar uh, situation here, we have these various ratios um, at the top. And as we can see, the ASHRAE standard 100 is in most cases significantly lower than um, the top end of the range that we included as a ratio reduction, that 25%. I think across most of these slides, um, the ASHRAE ratio is probably more like, with some exceptions, more like about 35 to 50% less than our means. Next slide. This is healthcare and laboratory. Uh, I think there are just two things to mention here. One is that like with the slide for the means, uh, hospital and inpatient uh, has one error and that the top of the mean is actually a little bit higher than that. So it would have a higher starting point and we'll correct that. Um, but nothing uh, really different on the rest of these building types, uh, except in this case, uh, for whatever reason, the ASHRAE uh, standard 100 target for laboratories is um, a, a smaller percent ratio of the, of the total mean. Next slide. This is lodging. We have a, a variety of building types included in this overall category. Most of them are pretty similar, except for uh, the nursing home and assisted living, which is uh, a part of this category. I think we have another question here. Maybe we can answer that now before moving on to the next slide. That sounds great. The question is, will the rules further define the building types or is this judgment left to the person doing site-specific target calculations? 
I'm guessing this might be a question for Chuck. Sure. Um, first, remember, we're going to distribute these uh, findings amongst Energy Star uh, building types. And for the most part, we're going to rely on the definitions in Energy Star um, almost all the time. I'm quite frankly challenged to think when we wouldn't, but we will be reviewing that. Um, so, you know, they will be defined there. Now, you know, when folks are assembling multi, uh, multi-use buildings, uh, they have a little bit of flexibility there, but, um, you know, the, the use of the energy star building types is, is the primary definitions we'll be using. And this is Faith. I'll add that in the, uh, on the commerce website, there's a workbook that we uploaded um, that shows a tabular form of what's being presented in these charts. And there's also a sheet that shows the breakdown at the energy star uh, property type level. So it shows how these would be assigned to the energy star property types. Thanks, Faith. I think we're going to keep going here. Next slide. This is mercantile, aka retail. Um, nothing uh, really dramatically different here either. I think that the the ASHRAE standard 100 targets are a little higher for enclosed mall and other retail here and then significantly lower for standalone retail store. And this is an example where um, in the case of the first two, our mean is, our regional mean is lower than the means and medians that were used for the ASHRAE target. Whereas uh, in the case of the retail store, our mean was actually a bit higher. So the, these differences in, in many cases reflect the fact that we're using regionally adjusted data for purposes of the target development. Next slide. We have one more question to jump in here. Will COVID-19 changes the build, will COVID-19 affect how buildings may now be operated? And will that be considered or factored in somehow? For example, increasing outside air. I think uh, I'm going to let Connors. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this is Chuck again. Um, you know, from a mandatory perspective, folks will be, you know, about four or five years out at least before they measure. Um, their their baseline UI. Uh, so, you know, I then, you know, we're all very hopeful, of course, that uh, the COVID um, is well behind us in five years. Uh, but it does bring up somewhat of a, a question if we need to make any adjustments around. Um, around incentive approaches uh, and I haven't thought about it. So, uh, you know, what would doubling the ACH of a building do to energy use? Uh, it's significant, but it's by no means a doubling of energy use. Um, we already do a whole lot of 100% outdoor air. Uh, simply because of the wide use of economizers in our state. Um, so and we'll have to, we'll have to think that through a little. Okay. On offices, um, the only thing to note really here is that um, one thing you'll see is that most of the total 
energy use intensities, that which is the full bar representing the mean. These are fairly similar across uh, all of these office types, but but they are broken out to uh, provide specificity and flexibility for the building owners. And um, so we see that the means are very similar and then not surprisingly, most of the targets would be fairly similar as well, at least um, as a starting point before any type of normalization factors are applied or um, any exceptions or exclusions. Next slide. This is public assembly. Um, I'm not going to say too much on this one, but if anybody has any specific questions, uh, raise their hand. And we can also go back to these. I'm going to start going through a little bit more quickly now that we've gone over the basic structure. Next slide. And we also have public order and safety combined with religious worship. And um, just to clarify, these are all categorized basically in the same way as the means. So they will be easier to reference if you're going back and reviewing the slides. Next slide. And this is for the service category. We do have um, quite a much more of a, a range for these building types uh, with both the means and the targets. Next slide. And this is warehouse and storage, which I believe is the final uh, set of building types. All right, I think uh, actually, if you go to the next slide, Santiago, I think we have one more slide here. So just to reiterate what Faith said earlier, we do have a tabular form of this continuum of EUI targets by climate zone. And the link is included in this presentation. And I believe the workbook is also uh, uploaded with the other materials for this meeting. And it also includes, the workbook also includes a crosswalk to the Energy Star Portfolio Manager property types. So unless anybody has any additional questions right now on the targets themselves, and we can definitely refer back to these um, later in the meeting, but unless anybody has any more questions now, I think we'll move on to some of the, the main considerations for deciding, you know, where, where does the policy go from here? We have this good range um uh to work with uh what would the key inputs be for deciding what the final target should be since i'm not seeing any questions i think we'll move on to the next section then okay so uh the first part of this section is just doing a recap of the public input on the EUI targets. And we don't have necessarily specific responses on these because the targets haven't been set yet, but I think that it's useful to recap this input and use it to inform our discussion today. And I'm sure others will have uh, additional input as well today. So um, this is a, a series of input that we received over, I, I think, two or three workshops that, that touched on the methodology for the targets and, and thinking about what criteria might be for the targets. And um, most of these represent uh, several similar uh, comments from various stakeholders. So the first uh, item is to a request to establish long-term targets aligned with uh, statutory 2030 and 2050 greenhouse gas reduction goals. And as I mentioned earlier, that, that isn't necessarily within the scope, well, it isn't within the scope of these particular uh, initial targets, but it is uh, a good thing to consider for future targets and for thinking about how we set these initial targets. 
The next input was to require steeper reductions earlier and then taper. And I think that uh, there are a number of rationales for that. I think uh, one of the main ones was just uh, ensuring that we meet these 2030 uh, economy-wide uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals, since these are the first, um, these this set of targets uh, with the 2026, 2027, and 2028 compliance dates, depending on size, are really the, the main opportunity for meeting 2030, uh, overarching 2030 greenhouse gas emission goals. The next one is include more stringent scenarios as something along the lines of a stretch goal target um, that jurisdictions could refer to to um, potentially adopt themselves as as kind of an above um, above standard requirement in their jurisdiction. The next item is to add uh, greenhouse gas intensity requirements, so something um, around greenhouse gas intensity along with uh, energy use intensity, which is the EUIs or how the, the law is currently structured. Uh, the next one is to, in some way, address on-site gas for heating in the targets. And uh, this connects back to uh, uh, maximizing greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions and what are ways to ensure that we're not just reducing energy, but that we're also uh, having an impact on carbon. The next uh, item is just confirming uh, several stakeholders confirm that they would like to see lower targets for newer construction. And um, there was an additional comment to treat recently constructed and permitted buildings as existing and to apply newer construction targets to buildings built to future codes. So that's something that we'll discuss a little bit more when we address the newer construction considerations at the end of this presentation. And then the last item was to align future codes with the building performance standard newer construction targets. So just confirming that if there are newer construction targets that that, that should be referred to or um, uh, addressed in some way within the context of future uh, Washington State Energy Code for commercial buildings. Next slide. So we have uh, a couple slides here, actually a few slides uh, looking at the target design context um, and definitely interested in input feedback from uh, people on the phone or in comments uh, that you could send in after this presentation. Um, but there are a number of things to really consider to understand, you know, where we where we're at in the time continuum uh, between now and uh, when these targets would have to be met, uh, when we have the compliance dates, and how it relates to uh, other uh, laws and and goals that are have been set by the legislature. So I'm just going to talk through these and um, submit comments. Uh, if, if you're interested in talking about any of them in a little bit more detail. So the first one is that we do have a statutory economy-wide greenhouse gas reduction targets um, that have been revised via House Bill 2311. And the 2030 targets are to achieve 45% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels. So that's by 2030. And by 2050, we as a state are, are supposed to be essentially carbon neutral, and that would be 95% below 1990 levels. So we don't have sector specific targets uh, for the building sector, for example, but it's just useful to take this into consideration as part of the overarching, tar uh, overarching context for the targets. 
The second item is that we have uh, we have kind of a long term planning horizon and that we're setting these targets in 2020, but the targets don't go into effect until uh, the first one's going to effect in 2026. So those compliance years are 2026 to 2028. Um, but that uh, com that first compliance date is actually 10 to 20 years later than the building stock data available for us to use to develop the mean EUIs that are the basis for the targets. And so that's mainly due to um, the lag in doing this kind of uh, major uh, building stock assessment on part of both uh, the regional data as well as CBEX. Um, we have 2012 CBEX, CBEX data, whereas the 2018 CBEX data won't be available. It's not available now. So this is just kind of a consideration. It's part of the nature of looking at uh, population data and energy use data for um, large populations of, of buildings in any particular area, especially for the commercial building stock. So the uh, means data used for the target development is from about 2008 to the energy use timeframe is from about 2008 to 2019. And then, um, and then you add an additional seven or so years to 2026. So the target development mean EUIs may be higher than um, the EUIs now or in 2026. The next item is that, uh, does somebody, okay, I'll keep going. It sounded like somebody was going to ask a question. Um, there are other standard 100 requirements that can help lower the EUIs. So the targets themselves are not the only uh, part of this policy, as we know. Um, so the building performance standard also includes things like the energy management plan, operations and maintenance plan, and various other components, all of which are likely along with market changes going to put downward pressure on the EUIs and help provide um, a good uh, support and context programmatically for uh, lowering the EUIs for buildings. Uh, another thing to note is that these are net energy EUI targets. So um, they are inclusive of on-site renewables. Um, I don't know if that affects things either way, and it also obviously depends on the building, a specific building itself, but just for everybody to keep in mind that this is inclusive of on-site renewables and is not um, kind of a, a subset of that. Next slide. We have a few questions we can maybe get into. Oh, okay, okay, great. Um, well, the first question is probably a question for Commerce is where do we stand today for greenhouse gas emissions versus the 1990 levels? And uh, I'd have to dig for that. Um, so the, just to recall from some of discussion over this is, um, remember these are absolute levels, not levels per square foot or anything. Um, I think buildings had a 50% growth in total greenhouse gas emissions. And that's largely due to growth in the population of buildings. Um, so the, you know, the, the building sector itself uh, has grown a good deal since 19 level 90. Now we've also bought a lot more cars, except uh, we can actually document uh, emissions reductions from automobiles in that same set of graphs. Um, and that's because automobiles uh, have continually improved and, and they get retired at a faster rate than buildings. So, um, that's off the top of my head. 
And then we have a question, uh, will analysis be done of the greenhouse gas reductions that will result from this act? So we know how much uh, this act has helped us meet our targets. I don't think we'll be able to do um, a, a real evaluation of that until um, we've implemented this standard. Um, so I, you know, I don't anticipate any um, evaluation prior to, you know, 20, 20, what is it, 26 when we go into our, or 29 when we go into the next rulemaking. And that's all the, the, the current, you know, standard is more focused on adopting all cost effective efficiency measures than it is focused on achieving a particular um, savings target. Austin, are we going to go on to these other questions or should I keep going? I, I think so. We had uh, one question from Holly, which was, um, we actually got two here. How can we know if we are meeting our goals if we do not measure? And I think what Chuck is saying I, is that um, the, the standard doesn't really come into effect until 2026. And then that's when we'll be able to start when it starts going into effect, after it's gone into effect and people have done their retrofits, we'll be able to then go in and see um, what we're doing. And, uh, and hi, hi, this is Holly. Out. Yeah, I just um, supposedly there is money for people to do things before 2026. Uh, so there will be buildings that were being done. So. Uh, it seems like there's an opportunity for measurement and we have all this money that's going to be spent. Um, I, I'd agree with that. We'll have a, a sample that uh, we will be doing some evaluation on. Uh, we do have a legislative report due based on that uh, incentive program. So, um, no, you're right. We're going to get some data here. Um, we're also going to be able to see um you know kind of these overall changes or changes as reported by utilities um, because they will be monitoring both um you know their you know overall achievement based on their incentive programs as well as this so um i'm just thinking a big comprehensive study where we really know what occur until we have a, a you know, really large population. That, uh, so am I hearing you right that you, know, you might be able, if you find that we're not uh, really reducing our greenhouse gases very well with this program earlier than five uh, years out, is that, is that when the targets are reviewed? Is we, won't, we won't change targets or is that well, what you so the schedule for this law is that um, we go through the first compliance schedule before we modify it again significantly. Um, and once again, that's the end of the decade. Uh, that's written in the law, essentially. Now, I'm not going to say that there might not be changes in the um, in the rules to some extent to um, make adjustments uh, with how the, the law is administered to adjust to, you know, changes out there. But I don't expect the targets to change over this uh, compliance period. Emily, do you want to say anything in addition to that? No, just the next update to targets will be in 2029. Thank you. 
And then we had one comment from Norm, which is to say that lowering energy use intensity is only a third of the equation required to implement greenhouse gas reduction targets. The other two components are fuel switching to non-carbon sources and renovation of the commercial building stock to utilize the renewable sources. I don't know if uh, Chuck or anyone wants to have a comment on that, but otherwise I'll, I'll, we can move. You know, Norm's right, that's part of it. Um, the overlap with uh, the Clean Energy Transformation Act, which will significantly lower our uh, greenhouse gases from electricity fairly quickly. Um, you know, they, these emissions reductions are going to come from multiple sources. I guess one other thing relative to this standard is that uh, a way to reduce site EUI is to, you know, convert from, uh, you know, combustion equipment to high efficiency heat pumps. Uh, that will have an impact that's fairly substantial, but I don't expect it to be uh, always cost effective when building owners analyze that route. Uh, when you say cost effective, are you taking into account the social impact of reducing carbon or just? This is a, based on a building owner cost. So to the extent that, um, you know, the actions uh, in change their, for example, their utility price. Um, that would be part of the equation. Um, we don't have any explicit rules built around uh, social cost of carbon in our, our rules. Right, I don't think we have any further questions or comments, so let's move forward. Great. So just a few other um, considerations for the target design process. There are also the normalization factors and exceptions, et cetera, as part of the overall policy. So applying normalization factors could increase or decrease the EUI targets for individual buildings. So just keeping in mind that these aren't um, absolute targets at a starting point for each uh, individual building. So there is that uh, kind of wraparound structure to the policy. Uh, additionally, uh, in terms of technologies, there are high performance technologies and design practices that can significantly reduce energy use and often this is at a low incremental cost. Um, and I didn't do an exhaustive list here, but just the transition to LEGs, LEDs that is actually already happening is having a significant impact on uh, particularly retail, grocery, uh, other building types that are uh, heavily, um, have heavy lighting loads. Um, also heat pumps, as uh, Chuck mentioned, uh, dedicated outside air systems, which are uh, a part of the code for many buildings um, on the new construction side in a certain degree existing. Um, they also are um, very effective in applying to existing buildings. Um, we have uh, robust energy management systems and sub-metering. And again, that has um, increasingly been uh, a requirement in the code. Um, so there are uh, a number of things already available and we're also looking again at this trajectory going on another six years, almost six years um, from now. So uh, an additional consideration in terms of technologies is just the need to leverage opportunities for equipment replacements prior to 2026. And this is something that came up in some of the discussion in the early workshops is that 
if we don't um, set it uh, low enough now or consider that um, in some other way as part of this target setting process, uh, we risk having all of this naturally occurring replacements between now and 2026 or 2025, whenever the cutoff would be for the actual bills, there's a risk of locking in higher using uh, uh, equipment. And then lastly, um, there's an issue of benefits and costs. Um, the efficiency measure costs are often incremental uh, to replacements or changes that would already be happening. So it's not the, the full amount. It's this additional efficiency. In some cases, there won't be an incremental cost because it's just the direction that the market has gone, but it will have an impact on the energy use and often lowering the energy use. And then in addition, um, there are net benefits over the life of the measures. And uh, there is the cost effectiveness backstop in the audit process, for example, that helps ensure that there is um, a payback. And so, Really, there are first costs involved, but the, the policy is really set up around ensuring that there are um, its positive value over the life cycle, uh, over the life of the measure. And in addition, there's access to state and utility incentive programs. So there are a number of, of factors that really um, can contribute to achieving lower EUIs and it's something to consider as really the larger context for thinking about where where these targets should land. Next slide. Okay, so here we have a few slides that are focused more specifically on the influence of various targets on the amount of floor area that would be affected. And we've done some initial high level analysis on that. And I'm going to hand this over uh, temporarily to Santiago to go over some of the details there, and then we'll circle back on the targets and particularly newer construction. As we transition uh, to Santiago taking, the, taking over the presentation, we want to uh, get to the question posted here by Colleen, will Commerce provide spreadsheets to help owners apply normalization factors and exemptions? Same questions for the financial life cycle calculations, or is all this in ASHRAE 100? It's our intention to develop both of the um, support tools that you've requested here. Um, we, I think the, the, we'll need a section seven tool to get people through um, the, the setting, the target setting exercise. Um, if we add more variables and be a somewhat more complicated tool, but well within the, uh, you know, skill set of a, a decent Excel programmer. Um, life cycle cost analysis. Uh, we, um, yes, we will uh, develop one. We posted a copy of a life cycle tool, well, a link to a life cycle tool that we developed for the state's office of financial management. And uh, we expect a simplified version of that as well as, um, you know, format it in a way that you can pull, easily pull your audit results out of um, the, uh, the ASHRAE 211 documents that we're referencing for audits and plug them in there with a limited amount of uh, fooling around. So those are our support um, ideas.
All right, take it away, Santiago. All right, thank you. Um, so we've done some preliminary analysis uh, to determine what the impacts are um, with uh, various uh, of target setting scenarios. Um, so we took uh, we took the um, distributions from the CBEX data set as a proxy for what uh, we might see in Washington uh, if we were to implement you know one or, or uh, one, one of these different uh, targets. Um, so here we have uh, shown uh, the percent of impacted buildings um, from each of these target set. So the percentages listed uh, inside of the bar uh, show you which, uh, what percentage of the population by square feet would be uh, impacted um, and uh, be required to uh, reduce their EUIs to, to meet targets. Um, so as you would expect, uh, the percentages increase uh, as we uh, go, go, down, uh, go down the bar in increasing difficulties of uh, EUIs to achieve. Um, and here we have uh, three buildings uh, in the education um, sector, which, uh, which we've calculated. So college, university, uh, elementary and middle school, and high school. Um, so you can see that uh, at the mean level, uh, you know, we have uh, percentages of 59%, 35%, 62% uh, impacted respectively. Um, and this is, of course, accounting for the different characteristics in these buildings and uh, what, uh, what proportions uh, we're likely to see of square footage. And uh, we've only included buildings that are above 50,000 square feet uh, in this distribution analysis. Um, so the percentages are uh, the ratio of uh, buildings, uh, total buildings uh, greater than 50,000 square feet uh, that are in this category and uh, impacted buildings uh, over 50,000 square feet in this category. Um, so that's generally what we're seeing here. Um, any questions about uh, these percentages? And uh, we'll, we'll have more of this analysis uh, at a later date, um, but this is just uh, one example we're providing of how, how we might uh, determine these impacts. So Santiago, I want you to repeat something. You, you, you filled in a blank there that's not on the slide, which is this is percent of floor area, correct? Correct. Yes, it's percent of square feet uh, for a building. So um, that's not necessarily, you know, saying that uh, that uh, 50. Not, for example, if we're looking at college university, we're saying that 59% of the square feet uh, that are in the college uh, university category are likely to be impacted. That does not mean 59% of buildings, uh, unless we were to, you know, draw some other conclusions about proportions here. But uh, yeah, it's it's not a total count of buildings; it is a total count of square feet. We have a question from Ted. Is it possible that different reduction targets? will be established to impact a similar percentage of buildings across all types. Um, so do you, do you mean to uh, say that uh, we should be setting targets uh, so that we're impacting square footage equally? I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Actually, I don't think I understood it at all. Uh, hey, this is Ted. Ted, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I guess the question is, would, would the targets be set so that, for example, you know, 30 percent of university buildings would be impacted, 30 percent of elementary school buildings would be impacted, and like 30 percent of office buildings? Okay. Yeah, so the, I, I understand. Um, so, uh, to, to do that, uh, we would be required to pick and choose what the targets are. Uh, you know, we would say that the, we would have to say that the percentages are different or the percentage reductions are different for each of these uh, building types. 
Um, and sure. I, I would just add that we're talking about square footage. We're not necessarily talking about buildings here. You can maybe interpret that as a proxy, but just be cautious that they're not the same. Uh, Chuck, and, I can't speak to how we might set different targets. And I, I just want to add on here too, this is Faith, that we don't, this, these are distributions out of CBEX, so the national data set. We don't have uh, the same for Washington State. So I think if if that approach, uh, if we were to go that direction, we would have to proceed very cautiously. Okay, thanks. And uh, I'll just add that uh, this does not reflect how much each of these necessarily need to change either. Um, the the percent of the percent of uh, the amount of effort needed to hit each of these targets is not reflected in these charts. That uh, that would be part of some additional analysis um, to show you know how much how much the EUIs need to be reduced in each of these scenarios too. So. It's not, it's not exactly, you know, apples to apples for a college university to reduce its EUI as it is for a, an elementary school. And this is Poppy. I'll also add to that, um, or to clarify, so this is kind of a high level indicator. And um, as Santiago mentioned, it doesn't, uh, quantify the amount of reduction that would be required. So if you're in the affected category, and this is just kind of to get an initial sense of how much square footage would be affected. Affected could mean one point or something like that. It could be anywhere from just a little bit um, over the mean to um, a much higher EUI. So this is kind of an initial step. And Santiago, if you go to the next slide, that might help illustrate the point as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me, Faith. Yes. Uh, this, so this slide uh, illustrates um, kind of the, the different levels of effort that would need to be achieved, uh, that would need to be uh, uh, undertaken to uh, reach different EUIs. So uh, the uh, area, the pink area shown here um, is the, uh, density of uh, elementary and middle schools uh, within the CBEX uh, data set um, at different EUIs. So you can see that the, 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 the approximate, you know, the, the biggest density here is uh, right there at the peak, uh, somewhere in the 50 uh, KB2 per square foot range. Um, and then each of these lines drawn through the chart uh, show that uh, everything to the right of the line uh, would need to reduce its energy use. So um, to give you a bit of context, uh, you know, you, you would see that uh, the percent change, you know, from the pink line, uh, uh, the pink line to the blue line is approximately the same as the blue line to the orangish line. So going, going from the Washington mean uh, to the 5% mean to the 10% mean, each of, each of those changes in area will be roughly the same. But the level of effort to go from, you know, uh, pink, pink to blue could be very different for, for the level of effort to go from uh, blue, blue to orange, or, or sorry, from, uh, from the 5% to the 10%, uh, because that, that's kind of reflected by, uh, you know, how, how much effort you need to put in there. Um, so this, this is just an indicator of uh, where, where those populations fall and kind of uh, uh, how much of them might be affected. Excuse me, does, does this um, distribution take into account the occupancy and op uh, operating hours of these buildings when you're looking at this? This, uh, this distribution um, is using uh, all of the uh, uh, factors that uh, could influence a building's EUI. So uh, this includes the, the whole plethora of impacts which you might see for uh, an elementary or middle school. Um, so this is this is just reflecting, you know, uh, you know the whole population uh, without without adding in any normalization factors or, or what have you. Those um, you know would would affect where you fall in this target uh, because you know the normalizations are 
um, a way to kind of introduce some fairness depending on your, your occupancy or operating hours. Um, but uh, it doesn't, it's not, it's not directly uh, reflected in this chart. We didn't uh, separate any of those into different categories. And then Santiago, we had a comment from Norm that said, uh, remember that building owners um, are faced with situations where EUI reduction investments will be in competition for scarce capital resources against investments in renewable heating sources that don't lower the building EUI but do reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the lower we go below the mean, the more we will create that conflict. Um, Chuck, do you have any comment? Uh, no, um, you know, higher ed submitted a, um, a pathway for campuses with, um, you know, campus based systems and we're, we're considering that very carefully. So, uh, thank you, Norm. I think Norm's given us a nudge on that one. Um, do we have any other questions? All right. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, I think Poppy has some uh, additional uh, information to give you about uh, newer construction considerations. Thanks, Santiago. So newer construction is um, in a little different category um, based on the Washington State Energy Code for commercial buildings um, here in the state. So a little bit of background here. The Washington Energy Code mandate um, 1927 requires that we reach 70% uh, energy reduction below a 2006 baseline by 2031 uh, in terms of the energy use of buildings that are built to the 2030-2031 code. So in addition, building characteristics and AUIs are changing in new construction due to the energy code and technology improvements. And the question really here is we've seen uh, a lot of these uh, possible targets on the continuums, a continuum based on these, uh, a series of ratios. And the question is, if we are to set uh, a separate uh, lower EUI target, set of targets for newer construction, what would be the inputs for making that decision and what are the um, what are the considerations for what those targets would be so we've laid out a few of those things here and um, one is we need to establish the code cycle cutoff for applying the lower targets is it uh, the 2015 code or later or the 2018 code i think 2021 is probably a little bit late in terms of the lag time of uh design and construction and getting enough bills not many uh buildings built to the 2021 code would actually be ready in time for this set of uh building performance standards so in addition uh we need to establish the magnitude of reduction compared to the base targets. And is it an additional ratio above and beyond that? Is it as in kind of a factor that is applied to that uh, base EUI target? Or is it uh, just a separate target, its own ratio? Um, Another thing to consider is, and particularly in relation to aligning with the directive in 1257, is that um, we need to consider what the what the incremental reductions are for these various uh, code cycles moving out across that horizon to 2031. So the 
Washington code is on a path to achieve in these incremental improvements um, to meet the 70% reduction goals by 2031, as can be seen in the next, the graphic in the next slide, if you could advance it, Santiago. So here we can see that the um, how we could use the energy code incremental improvements as a context for setting uh, setting the level of uh, the building performance standard newer construction targets. Uh, this uh, covers both residential and commercial, and um, it has two estimates. Um, the top estimates are based on uh, uh, model-based impact analysis of what was actually achieved um, with the codes that were developed up through 2018. And then the bottom two rows, uh, the red and the blue bars, show what incremental reductions should be targeted along this trajectory to 2030. So what we can see here is that um, one 2015 you'll notice is missing here. That analysis I think is currently in progress. It, um, there was some lag on the 2015, but 2018 uh, has been conducted. And so I'll reference that those numbers here for commercial to give a sense of where we're at. But it says 69%, that's toward the goal. And so if you take the reverse of that, it's, it's about 41% reduction um, that is has been modeled to have been achieved by the adopted 2018 code. Um, if you go back to 2012, the last number that we have um, for commercial is uh, 82% is the progress, so that is an 18% reduction. So somewhere between 2015 is somewhere between 18% and 41% um, with uh, knowing that there were some significant additions to the 2015 code. Um, it's probably getting a little bit closer to 2018. That said, this is just kind of a basis for thinking about it and uh, what that uh, ratio might be. Maybe it's, uh, you know, less than the 41 percent or we we get to some uh, middle point. But this is just the purpose of this slide is just to provide some some background for thinking about how this relates to the code itself. Next slide. We have a question. OK. Will the difference between the Washington State Energy Code and the Seattle Energy Code be considered? Uh, we haven't, uh, that hasn't been something that we were currently planning to consider, mainly because this uh, building performance standard is applying to the whole state. Um, it might be useful from an analytical perspective, but I think uh, currently it's not something that, that we're doing. So um, I think that we're getting close to the end of time here. So um, I'll just quickly say that um, the possible newer construction compliance path is to establish targets based on some portion of savings projected in that trajectory toward the 70% reduction by 2031 and to uh, figure out the best uh structure for that compliance in terms of maybe it's uh, we need to require retro commissioning for buildings that don't meet that newer construction target, or perhaps if they don't actually meet the overall base target, then they're required to uh, comply with sections eight and nine of, of standard 100. So that is all that we have on uh, the new construction and um, all of the main content that we wanted to go over with everyone today. So with that, I think I'll hand it either back to Faith or um, back to Commerce for wrapping up. I'll, I'll let uh, Emily wrap up since we're down to the last minute. All right, well, real quick, thank you so much. Faith, Santiago, and Poppy for the great presentation today. 
Next steps moving forward from here, we're requesting comments on this presentation by July 2nd. You can submit your comments via email at buildings, or I'm sorry, buildings at commerce.wa.gov. All of the comments received we are posting to the web page. You can navigate there through a link on the right hand side. And I just wanted to extend our gratitude for everybody uh, participating. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your participation and we uh, appreciate it. Have a great day.